Bible reading is from Mark chapter 10, reading from verses 17 to 27. The rich and the kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Helen, so much for that. Now, would you join me in prayer as we come to the time of the preaching of the word? Lord Jesus, we thank you for gathering us as your church and your people. And today, as we commit our hearts and our lives afresh to you, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and shine the light on the scriptures, that the truth will come alive in our hearts and give the way for us to see the world and ourselves and our hearts differently. Bless us with a fresh revelation of who Christ is, the perfect and full representation of God our Father. In Jesus Christ, your name we pray. Amen. In life, there comes a moment when we deeply think about our lives and ask these deep, profound, philosophical questions of life, such as, who am I? What is my life purpose? What is the meaning of my life? What happens when someone dies? Is there a God? Etc. To some of us, this moment comes as a significant and unforgettable event occurs. To others of us, this moment comes as we deal with the boredom of daily life or a feeling of loneliness. One way or another, we all ask these profound questions of life as human beings. And until we find the answer, our hearts are restless. In today's Bible reading, we meet somebody who is searching for an answer. And in a lot of ways, this man is like us. The text calls him a rich, young ruler. Now, you might think, I am not rich, or uh, I have way too many gray hairs to call myself young. But we will see in the story that this man is very much like us modern people in the West. In 2017, Gabi and I went to India to see my father who was working there. My father's colleague picked us up from the airport and it was only after we hopped in the car that we noticed 
that most cars on the road did not have side mirrors. It was quite thrilling experience <laughs> sitting at the back of the car and watching how people drive without side mirrors on the busy road in the city. Let me put it this way, there was no time for jet lag. <laughs> then the second cultural shock came as I looked further outside the window. We passed by some people lying on the ground who had fallen off their bikes and no one seemed to care and my father told me that hundreds of people die that way every day in India. Today, more than 1.2 billion, billion people live on less than $2 a day. And they say if you can afford a coffee every day, that means you are wealthier than a third of the people on the planet. Some time ago, I checked some facts. In 2018, Australia had overtaken Switzerland to record the highest wealth in the world. And the average wealth per adult in Australia was the second highest in the world. Now, comparably, we are living a comfortable life in Australia, are we not? And what else do we see about ourselves looking at the man in the story? The text says that he is a young but a ruler. He has kept all the laws. In other words, the man is goal-oriented. This person is a sensible and self-sufficient person. He is an educated person who tries to do the right thing. He is very much like most modern people today. He is living a good and comfortable life as many of us are here in Australia. But in the story, man doesn't seem satisfied with his life. He is looking for a deeper meaning and purpose. And he seems quite desperate. Then one day he turns to what people of the day would have called a new religion. The text says this man runs to Jesus and falls on his knees before him and says, I have everything that I need. I became everything that I wanted to be. I have a good and comfortable life, but I still don't feel that I've got there yet. Then he asks Jesus this profound philosophical question of life. What must I do to have eternal life? In other words, he is asking, is there more to life than this? This morning, let me ask you a question. Has the moment come to you yet where you ask that profound question, is there more to life than this? than this. If it hasn't, are you prepared for when this moment comes, as it will? You may have heard of this guy named David Foster Wallace. He is a famous American writer widely known for his novel Infinite Jest, which the Time magazine cited as one of the 100 best novels in the 20th century. He once gave a speech to the graduating class at a college. He told this story to the young students. There are two young fish swimming along in the water. And they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says this, Morning boys, how is the water? And the two young fish look at each other and say, What the hell is water? <laughs> what Wallace is saying is that modern people are like the young fish. The young fish 
have always been in the water and they've only known the life inside the water. As a result, they can't even imagine what is outside the water, nor think about the possibility of life outside the water. Similarly, Wallace would say that a lot of us today, modern people, would live our lives as if the life here and now is the only reality that there is. And as it did to the man in the story, there will come times in our lives when we will need the answer to the question, is there any deeper meaning of life? Some years ago, I went to see a doctor for a health check. There was a young Canadian doctor. She looked only a few years older than me, and she was very friendly. And we were chatting, and I was about to put my arm through the blood pressure check machine. And then she asked me this question. So Noah, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I said, uh, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. Usually my conversation with a stranger would stop right there. But this Canadian lady got very interested and asked, oh wow, what led you to that career? It was an unexpected question, so I panicked a little bit and my heart started pounding fast. <laughs> it was a very awkward moment to be asked that question. With the band tightening my arm, I thought, oh boy, this test isn't going to go very well. Then the, the doctor looked at the monitor and said, your blood pressure is high. Is your job stressful? And I thought to myself, no, my job is fine, but your question is. After that, she showed me a book that she was reading. It was something about spirituality. She was searching for a deeper meaning. She was searching for a connection. There is this universal thing about the human heart. It does not matter how smart or young you are, every one of us has a deep bucket in our hearts that needed to be filled up. Every one of us wants to be affirmed, valued, trusted, loved, and welcomed so that we would be happy. And some people would try to fill the bucket with money. Some people would try to fill it with how they look. Some people would try to fill it with romance. Some people would try to fill it with their career and people's approval. The man in the story tried several things. He tried it with wealth and his morality. But his heart was still restless. This morning, this story asks us this honest question. What is it that you are trying to fill up your bucket with? What is it that you are pursuing? Has that given you peace and rest in your heart? David Wallace, who was not a believer in God, put it this way. He said this, In the day-to-day -day trenches of life, there is actually no such a thing as atheism. There is no such a thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And what we worship will eat us alive. If you worship and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty, you will always feel ugly. And ta when time and age start to showing, you will die a million different deaths because uh, before you find, they finally plant you. Worship power. You will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Now some of us might ask, well that sounds very pessimistic. 
But isn't it true as movies, novels, songs, and artworks talk about it throughout centuries? If you know anything about the human heart, there is a great void in it, which things of this world cannot fill. Then what will satisfy our hearts? What will fill up our buckets? Jesus says this to the man. Come, follow me. Pursue me. I am the answer. And Jesus says, to follow me, you must give up on whatever you've been using to fill the void in your heart first. In the rich young ruler's case, it was his wealth and self-righteousness. Jesus says to him, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. In my early 20s, I used to work at an after-school camp. Working there, I swore to myself that I would never have more than two children. <laughs> and I've been very faithful to that oath. <laughs> you know, one, one thing beautiful about being around the children is that you learn from them as much as you, they learn from you. One day, a half dozen of kids were playing inside a sand pit. And I was there with them and watched them build some amazing things. They built houses, castles, apartments with the sand. They even drew some money, uh, not money, drew some water to build canals and beautiful waterfront houses with the sand. They even named their buildings after their names. Then, after a couple of hours, when it was 5.20 p.m., we heard another teacher shouting from a distance, everyone, it is time to pack up. People in the sand pit, it is time to come out. It is time to pack up and get ready to go home. Your parents will be here soon. Hearing that, they all got out, leaving their achievements behind, and they got ready to be picked up by their parents. Well, my son Daniel would have said, well, my daddy has to wait until I finish. <laughs> Friends, if you know who Jesus Christ is and how he can satisfy your heart, you'll see that whatever you are now pursuing to be happy is like the sand in comparison to his beauty and love for you. There is none like Jesus. Then you might think, okay, Noah, what makes you be so sure of that? How do you know if Jesus is the answer and he will truly fill the void in my heart? Look at verse 21. It says this, Jesus loved the young rich man. Now, just to think for a moment about what Wallace said. He said that things that we pursue in our lives will eventually eat us alive. Whether it is money, beauty, career, or romance, the more we love them, the more they will enslave us. But Jesus says this in Mark 10, verse 45. I did not come to be served but to serve. In other words, he says, we cannot ever outlove Jesus. As his love for us will always be greater than our love for him. We heard at the baptismal ceremony this morning, God first loved us before we chose him. Jesus can fill the void in our hearts because he is a perfect and full representation of God who made us and loves us. Billy Graham, the greatest evangelist of our day, was once on a plane. The person who sat next to him recognized Billy Graham and said to him this, I am a Christian too. Billy Graham then asked the man how he came to faith. 
This guy's head fell and he said, we had a child, our only child, but she was killed in a car accident. He said, I knew I had been resisting God for a long time, but when I stood and watched her little casket go down into the grave, I realized what caused God to give me a new life and how much he loved me. That day I said to God, Lord, Jesus, come into my heart and I will live for you. Friends, do you know this God who loves you? Do you know this God who made you? The man in the story could not see it, but do you see it? St. Augustine puts it this way, Our heart is restless until it rests in God who loves us through Jesus Christ. Where is your heart this morning? Is it resting in God who loves you? The Bible is the greatest love story ever told. It tells us that God gave his son so that our sins are forgiven and our hearts may be made whole again. The Bible tells us this. When God created the world, it was perfect. Nothing was lacking in the world that he created. But when the first man and woman who God had created decide to be gods themselves and live apart from God, sin entered the world. The separation from the Creator was the beginning of dissatisfaction in the human heart. Then for God to reconcile with us, our sin had to be dealt with, and the debt of the sin had to be paid. So what did God do? He decided to take the hit for us. He gave his one and only son Jesus on the cross for your sins and my sins. And then he raised him to a new life three days later so that you and I would know that the payment is true and is fully made. Can we ourselves make our hearts whole again? Can we save ourselves? Can we stand before God ourselves? It says, with men it is impossible, but Jesus made it possible through his death. Jesus took the hit for you. He died the death you and I deserve so that we may gain his life. Jesus is the way, truth, and life. He is the love that you have been searching for. He is the everlasting hope. He is your joy, and he is the way to your creator and eternal life. Jesus Christ is the one that will fill your heart. This morning, do you know him? Is your heart resting in him and on him? If you don't, would you not welcome him into your heart? This morning, I believe we have a moment. I usually ask people to close their eyes to make this public declaration but today I'm going to ask you to do something bold and express yourself boldly before your people. If you have not received Christ and ask him to come into your heart yet, and if you'd like to do that today in front of people who love you, support you, and would pray for you, would you stand? Would you stand where you are if you'd like to welcome Jesus into your heart? I'll give you a few moments. Christ died for you. He gave you a new life. And in him there is new life. And your life will be made whole again in Christ. If that is you this morning, would you stand where you are so I can pray for you? The reason why I'm asking that we are doing this in public is 
because you are going to remember this moment for the rest of your life. And people in this room will remember this for the rest of your life and think about you and pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great decision. I'll give a few more minutes. Stand where you are. Great decision. The Holy Spirit is moving in this place, touching the hearts, knocking on the door. Is it between you and God? You will remember this moment for the rest of your life. The precious moment. Wonderful moment. Great decision. Thank you, sir. Just a few more moments. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Holy Spirit, come, move. Touch the hearts. But Father, we thank you for your presence and the way that you minister to us. We give our hearts to you afresh, knowing that you're a God who loves us and fills our hearts. And today is the new day for these friends and for us as a church congregation. Do your work. We thank you for the gift of life and the way that you've expressed that love to us in Jesus Christ. New life, new beginning, new day, new dawn. We give you thanks for that. As we choose to turn away from our wicked ways and our sins and receive you and have you as our king in our hearts, Lord, lead us and guide us. Be our center and our guide. In Jesus Christ, your name, we pray. Amen.